Hello and a warm welcome to 5 by 15 this evening, one of our last events before Christmas and we're so thrilled this evening to be joined by Dennis Duncan and John Lloyd as we celebrate this brilliant book, Index, A History of the, and I hope you can all see that. Dennis Duncan is a writer, he's a translator and a lecturer in English at University College London um, and his book is unmissable. I know that Vivian at New and Books will be delighted to help you to purchase a copy if you haven't already and the details will be in the chat. Thank you Stephanie. I think it's a perfect Christmas present, so um, I hope people will get a copy. And in conversation this evening, we have the wonderful John Lloyd, a longtime friend of Five by Fifteen. He's a television producer. Um, he created Not the Nine O'Clock News, Spitting Image, and produced all four of the Blackadder series. More recently, he's co-produced BBC Two's QI and is the presenter of BBC Radio 4's The Museum of Curiosity. And his latest book is Funny You Should Ask Again, which is questions answered by the QI else. So please put your questions for Dennis in the Q&A box and we are going to come to as many as we can towards the last 15 minutes or so of this session. But for now, I will disappear into the virtual wings and say a warm welcome to John. Thank you both for being with us and over to you. Thank you, Daisy. Well, um, yeah, Dennis uh, has written lots of books actually and many, many articles, done lots of translations but he's really stepped up to the plate here with, in sort of bestseller mode, because this really is, it's an absolute crack of this book. And if I may say so, Dennis, it's a very QI book because it takes something which is on the face of it, grindingly dull and makes it really more than quite interesting. And I wanted to ask you, first of all, what on earth possessed you to think there was a good book in a history of the index? <laughs> well, that's a really good question. Thank you. Um, well, I suppose the, uh, um, the idea behind it is that this is the, the, the age of search. I mean, it might seem a very niche thing or, or, or whimsical idea, a history of the book, the, the, the book index. <clears throat> but if you think about the book index as the, the precursor to the uh, search engine, uh, um, that the, the structure that underpins uh, a search engine is, is, is an index, is, is this thing which, which, as I say in the book, was invented in the early 13th century. It's it's the most essential tool of, of, uh, of our kind of daily lives these days. I, I imagine there's not a single person here who's watching this who hasn't typed something into Google already today. If not Google, then, then uh, you know, other flavors are available. But every time we do that, every time we search for something, every time we you know, have that curiosity, uh, over the last 20 years, we've developed this sort of insatiable curiosity because information's at our fingertips. You know, who was that player? What were they in? Isn't she dead? That kind of thing. Um, we're able to uh, satisfy that itch in a way that we, you know, previously in, in sort of human history haven't been able to, thanks to the search engine, which yeah. is thanks to what lies behind it. Google, Google say their process is crawling and indexing. By crawling, they mean they have their web spiders that go and search every single web page. But that doesn't happen when you type in your search words. You don't search uh, pushcast, angry football or something like that. And then it goes and, and searches every web page. It does the searching, the crawling in the background and puts the results into index tables. So when you do your searching, you're actually not searching the web, you're searching Google's index of the web. So that's really why the, the, this, the, it, kind of seemingly kind of whimsical thing um, is really an exploration of how did we arrive at this moment? What's the sort of hinterland of this technology where we're able to find out everything, um, you know, the, 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 the press of a few buttons. And that's very good. So it's rather like people thought sometimes say QI is like a Radio 4 show, quite old fashioned and so on, but it's very, very modern in the way that we operate and we couldn't possibly have done it without the web. Um, I like the thing, so the, the idea of an index obviously is actually much more ancient than we think because I think as you point out in the book, when you wander into your kitchen and you think, where are the tea bags or the scissors, you've, you've made an index beforehand, haven't you? That's, that, that's, it's a little handy reference, a locator as you call it in the book, I suppose. And that's exactly right, yeah. Uh, uh, an index essentially in the abstract is, is, a, is a table with two columns, one column um, needs to be in an order that you know, uh, usually an alphabetical order in a book index. And the other column is the thing that you don't know. Where is the thing? So in order to find the thing that you don't know, you're able to look it up in a thing that I know, uh, a thing that you know. So you've got your sort of uh, two 
two column ordering system. Well, that, that's in oh, itself sorry. is very interesting because alphabetical order, I mean, I think in the book you say that the Romans didn't use alphabetical order. So that's a, you think things that we take for granted is obvious. The, the book is full of these, by the way, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, I have honestly made an index of the, of the book myself. It runs for several, several pages. It's absolutely crammed with these standout pieces of information that particularly the thing that you're very good at, Dennis, is things that you think are obvious that they're, they're not. So alphabetical order, I'd love to know about. I'd like to know um, where, where does an index, where do we really start with indexes? Well, I think alphabetical order is a good place to start. Like I said, if you imagine an index is, is two columns, one is the one that's in an order that you don't know. Um, and the other one is the one that you can, you can search through. I know the orders, the letters, the alphabet. So that will allow me to find the thing that I'm looking for cross-reference to the other column. And that will point me to the thing that where I didn't know it. So alphabetical order, um, really has sort of different roles. Alphabetical order arises possibly uh, the first thousand years uh, um, BC, but in different forms. I mean, initially, the order of the letters of the alphabet um, is probably just a learning aid. There's no reason, there's absolutely no reason why A comes before B, B comes before C, or, or alpha comes before beta, or Aleph comes before Beth in, in uh, earlier versions of the alphabet. It's just convenient. They might as well go in some order because that makes it easy to learn. And so we learn the alphabet by singing it. We learn A, B, C, D. You know, the, the, the tune is um, Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Da, 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 da. And that just makes it easy for us to learn the letters. So we learn them in, a, in an order. Um, but we're not doing anything. We're not using alphabetical order for any other purpose than, than to learn the letters of the alphabet. That comes a bit later, using the letters of the alphabet in order to locate things, using things to put things, file things in alphabetical order, comes around about 300 BC. Um, and it's the, it's the solution to a big data problem, that the Library of Alexandria um, It's founded about 300 BC and is the largest library you could imagine. It's not like this behind me. This, these, these are books that we call codex, codices, a book that is, is, is made up of, of pages that are folded and stitched and bound. What we think of as a book doesn't really come around till the first or second century AD. Up until then, everything is scrolls. So imagine these shelves behind me are all scrolls, um, but not just a, a few shelves of them, maybe half a million. The Library of Alexandria is astonishingly, unimaginably sort of big, particularly for its time. Um, how do you find the scroll that you're looking for? Well, the head librarian, a man called Callimachus, um, possibly head librarian. If not, he worked there and was grumpy at being over overlooked for the job of, of head, head librarian. Anyway, mm -hmm. Callimachus has the first idea of, well, hang on, if I put the authors in alphabetical order of their names, then I can put a sign up and say, if you're looking for, you know, Homer, he's over there. He comes a few after Euripides. Um, Sophocles is, is, is much further down the corridor. So the idea of, of, of using the letters of the alphabet that people know to tell you what's, what's our progress through this, uh, uh, this large amount of data. Well, I'm you know, halfway through the alphabet, that means I'm halfway through the data, um, emerges in response to that big data problem of, oh my God, so many scrolls. Um, that's the first, first time it gets used. And then it gets taken up quite quickly around uh, uh, the Greek speaking world. Um, in that century, you find it in uh, you know, various various things, various surviving stones. Um, but as you say, you think, well, this is going to be really useful. This, the, you've cracked the big data problem now. We, we, we've got something really convenient that everybody knows. But then you get a, a vast empire like the Romans, um, who are famed administrators. They don't bother with it for some reason. The, the this this wonderful kind of advance. Um, to the Romans seems uh, unnecessary. So the Roman administration is not based on alphabetical order. We know that some Greek is because little bits of fragments of um, scrap paper uh, from tax collectors, things like that. There's, there's a um, huge trove that's still only just now being explored and translated of Greek waste paper. Well, one of, the, one of the things I particularly liked in your book is that many ancient texts uh, only come to us down in fragments yeah. because they were used to stuff and stiffen the leather covers of later books. 
That's right. Yeah, I'll show, show you. So, so fantastic. Here's, here's an old leather bound book. Um, here, I'm not, I'm not going to tear it open, but if I did, this stiff board here, this cover, is probably just made up of um, lots of other bits of, of paper that have been squashed together. Things that were lying around the print shop, things that had misprints on, things that never got sold. You just crown them together, stick them, cover them in, in leather, and that gives you a nice hard binding. But it does mean that um, when these books kind of fall apart, you find things that are even older than the book. You find medieval manuscripts used to wrap 16th century printed books and stuff like that. So some of the uh, manuscript culture that comes down to us has been in this kind of time capsule of being used as crap to wrap a book in, basically. <laughs> Another thing is you mentioned uh, scrolls, the mm. little tags they had. So you could identify the scroll, they had a little tag on them, didn't they? They were called syllaboy, which is where we get the word syllabus from. I love yeah, that. That's got an even more curious history, actually. I, this, this came to me when I was, I was doing one of these talks with uh, Susie Dent. And uh, she sent a few questions in advance. She said, oh, I might just ask you about Thank the you. Uh, history of the, the word syllabus. And I thought, all right, well, I, you know, I don't want to get caught out by Susie Dent asking me that. <laughs> so I'm going to swat up on that. And sure enough, I think it was a trick question. I'm, I'm worried that she, that she was going to <laughs> trip me up because syllabus has got a very strange history. Um, the, uh, uh, yes, like I say, if you have your scrolls stored there, um, it's, di it's difficult to know what they are. They all look the same. I've got hundreds of scrolls. How do I know which one is the, uh, which one's the Iliad and which one's the Odyssey? Um, so you'd have, let me think, what can I show you? One second. Have a scroll like this, and it would have a little tag, which would stick over the shelf. And that was called um, a syllabus. Uh, it would tell you what's in the thing, just the way that a syllabus tells you what's in a course. And we know that because, uh, uh, um, who was it? Cicero writes uh, to his friend Atticus saying, can you come and, and, and put some syllabus on, on my thing? Except he doesn't. He uses the word syllabus, And the word syllabus only emerges in the 15th or 16th century when manuscripts are just starting to be printed for the first time. What would happen in, in, in a Renaissance print shop is somebody would get an old manuscript and then uh, the person in the print shop would letter by letter copy it out into print and they'd put it on the press and they'd print it. Now somebody misread S-I-T-T-Y, to uh, misread it as S-I-L-L-Y. So the word syllabus, which we think has got this ancient thing, is actually a, 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 a late medieval misprint of the word syllabus. There's no such word, classical word a syllabus. It's all a mistake. That's apparently the same with the word tweed. I don't know why, since we're talking. Do you know that? No. It, it was a misreading of the word tweel, sort of Scottish, you know, for twill. Oh, wow. Um, and so it's become tweed. But so, OK, so the book, the codex basically uh, comes out of the scroll. It's a new way of, of ordering paper. Uh, hmm. But here's the thing, another well, stunning piece of information. The index predates page numbers. So it was like, I mean, centuries, wasn't it? I mean, actually more than, what is a thousand years before somebody thought of putting page numbers on books. Uh, that is ast astonishing. Explain that to me. To us. Well, the, the, the reason for this is to do with print. Uh, um, when we're talking about books as, as manuscripts, a book can still be a, a codex like this, folded and bound, looks like a book, um, but it's all written out by hand because printing hasn't been invented. So when we're in that era, the, the manuscript era, where every book has to be copied, every copy of a book literally is a copy of a book, it takes months, a monk will sit with a text in front of him and an empty book in front of him and he'll copy the text. But what he's not doing is paying any attention to how it's laid out on the page. He might be copying from a small book into a big book. He's just making sure that he gets the words right. So um, a book that's 200 pages might end up being copied into a book that's 400 pages. So page numbers, you see them occasionally in medieval manuscripts, but they aren't very useful or, or they only apply to that 
copy of the book. And all of the things that we like to do with page numbers these days, which are referencing, footnotes, indexes, we like to write to other people and say, oh, you're going to love what's on page 47, or I, you know, I looked at page 63 and I thought of you. That doesn't work in the medieval period, because as, if you and I don't have exactly the yeah. same book, if we're not looking at the same book over each other's shoulders, yeah. then the pagination makes no sense at all. It's only when print comes in that every copy starts to look the same. You, you, you set up your type print, bang, 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 bang. There's a thousand copies. I send one to Venice, one to Warsaw, and we can all be on the same page, as it were. Um, then we can start to do, you know, then indexing by page number becomes useful. Then footnoting becomes useful. But up until that point, um, it's not much fun. Page numbers don't make much sense. I came across a book in, there's a library in Cambridge, St. John's College, that has a medieval manuscript from the late 1300s. Um, and the index there has been copied by hand. And the poor old monk who copied the book out has then copied the index out. And he doesn't really know what an index is or how it works. <laughs> so he's copied out the page numbers exactly as they are. And they don't work. And so you've got, he says, Alexander, on page 67, Alexander in his conquests reached this city of Tyre, turn to page 67. No, Alexander's dead. He died five pages ago. Um, and the whole index is like this. It's like, it's like a, a, a document that, that on, on the internet that's just full of broken links. Click anything and it goes 404, page not found um, in this, this funny, <laughs> funny, sweet manuscript. The poor old scribe who did it has signed his name as well. I mean, <laughs> he, he spent three months that's copying this thing out and then he goes, John Lutton's got to the end of this. And then he copies out the index and it's rubbish. <laughs> yes, yeah, so, so printing, uh, Gutenberg's first uh, movable type printing, uh, es Escapade the Bible in 1455. So now you've got standardized books, all exactly the mm. same, running off the presses. Um, and, but it's still another 15 years before anybody has the idea of printing page numbers on each page. That's right. That's right. But when it but happens, you've seen the first, you have seen the very first page number, haven't you? <laughs> it's one of my favourite things. I have indeed. It's a it's a very small printed sermon um, from Cologne, uh, and this is the, the first printed page number that makes such a difference to uh, um, to the way that we can use books. Do you mind? I'm going to read a little bit out of my encounter Lovely. with this in uh, um, in the Bodleian Library in Oxford. This is the uh, um, Yes, this is the section. I'm in the Bodleian Library in Oxford with a small printed book open on the desk in front of me. This is the text of a sermon and it was printed uh, in 1470 in Cologne at the print shop of a man called Arnold Terhernan. The book is no larger than a paperback, about that size. Um, and the text itself is short, just 12 leaves or 24 pages long. But sitting here in the library with the book before me and opened on its first page is, I think, the most intense experience that I've had of the archival sublime, the sense of disbelief that something so significant, something of such conceptual magnitude should be here on my desk among my own workaday effects, laptop, notebook, pencil. It feels astonishing that I should be allowed to pick it up, to hold it, to turn its pages as though it were a novel I purchased at the train station. Why is it not under glass, sealed off, labelled and exhibited where crowds of schoolchildren might look but not touch? There's a name for this feeling, Stondhal syndrome, after the French novelist who, on a visit to Florence, described the palpitations he experienced at being so close to the tombs of the Renaissance masters. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm on the verge of tears. The sermon was written by Werner Rollevink, a monk from the Cologne Charter House. Rollevink would become famous for writing the Fasciculus Temporum, or the Little Bundle of Dates, a history of the world from the first day of the creation to the bleeding edge of the present, in this case, the 3rd of May, 1481, the date on which Rollevink informs us the Ottoman Emperor, Mehmet II, went to hell for his wickedness against <laughs> Christianity. But the lengthy and complex fasciculus was still a work in progress when Rolovink penned this short sermon to be preached on the feast of the presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, otherwise known as the 21st of November. 
If the truth be told, however, it's neither Roll of Ink nor his preaching that make this book special for me. It's something else, something about the book itself there in the right hand margin, halfway down, a single large capital J. The ink's bled slightly, the impression slightly too strong, so that the letter's a little smudgy, without the detail and clarity of the Gothic lettering in the main text block. Nevertheless, I love this J all the more for its blurriness. I'd rather it were this way, characterful, let's call it, than that other J, crystalline, a perfect impression just to the left of it in the main text, beginning the word Joachim. Our marginal J has nothing to do with Joachim. It's pure coincidence that they should appear side by side like this. In fact, our J is not really a J at all. It's there as a numeral one, announcing that this is the first leaf of the book. Our J is the first printed page number. It will revolutionize the way that we use books. And in doing so, it will become such a commonplace that it will almost disappear from view, hiding in plain sight at the edge of every page. Yeah, it's, it's also fascinating to realize that even though it's obviously such a revolutionary idea, like a lot of them, a lot of revolutionary ideas, it was slow to catch on. So it's, again, it's like by the end of the, by 1500, only about 10% of books you say mm. still had page numbers. And I, I'll tell you another thing I loved in this in the book is, I don't know if you know this, but the um, early, uh, early aeroplanes um, had, well, how did they had, because planes came after cars, so they had steering wheels. <laughs> and uh, early, uh, early cars were, were steered by reins because it comes from horses. What? Yeah. And you, what you say, I think was brilliant, is that when printed um, books came, started to come out, they tried to make them look as much like medieval manuscripts as possible, even oh. to the point they had typefaces that looked like handwriting. Well, we still have that. I mean, if, you, if most most typefaces that we use, most fonts that we use in the computer, still have little things like the the uptick on a T or the little yeah. tail on a U. These are all directional. These are all to do with right-handed people writing uh, writing script. There's no reason certain uh, modernist typographers don't like that. They want their letters to be bolt upright and look completely geometrical because they don't like these sort of vestiges of uh, of print pretending to be uh, uh, writing, which it's not. So let, uh, there's so much we could talk about. I, don't, I really don't know where to start, but um, there are, uh, one thing that occurred to me is why don't novels have indexes? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, uh, I suppose one answer to that is a handful of them do. There's, there's a couple of categories of novels that do have indexes. The first category of novel I think that has indexes are uber classics. There's, there's an index to Proust, um, Jane Austen acquired an index in the wow. late 19th century. Uh, Walter Scott, similarly, <clears throat> has an index to Shakespeare. And the reason for this, I think, is, is that these, these are books that are, we're supposed to come back to. I, I should say, so mostly the, the reason that novels don't have indexes is because we read them once and then we put them away. An index yeah. is a navigation tool. It's a bit like saying if you have a very long straight road with, with no turnings, um, why does it not have street signs? Well, it doesn't need any because there's, a, there's only one thing that you do. Yeah. So that oh, that's novel reading is a particular type of reading. It's, it's the one type of reading that we do is that, that's completely sort of linear. You, you read a story at the beginning and you read it to the end and then you take it to the charity yeah. shop. One of the things that is interesting that, again, you, you, you touch on quite extensively in, in the book is that if you're uh, doing an index of emotions, for example, mm. novels are rather good for that. I mean, there's a fabulous thing where somebody went through some sentimental, I think, 18th century novel and logged all the time somebody burst into tears. Yeah, I've got it here. This is oh, the amazing. man of feeling. Now, as you say, yeah, this is an 18th century novel, but it's a 19th century edition. So this is the, the sort of high Victorians mocking the emotional incontinence of, of, the, of the late 18th century. Um, so it's a man called Henry Morley. He was a predecessor of mine at, at UCL, who's written the, gosh, let me just say something about the book. You see this novel, it's smaller than my hand. It's about the size of a mobile phone. Um, on the back, they have sold advertising space. Can you see that? This little yeah. thing's got adverts for Yorkshire relish, Goodall's egg powder, same 
on the fly leaves, pocket handkerchiefs. Now you don't get that in many novels these days where they've actually sold advertising space on the leaf. So this is a really cheap edition. This is, this is a book designed to be sold to the emerging uh, um, literate working class. The Education Act of 1870 and suddenly everybody has to learn to read a little bit. Um, what are they going to read? Well, you get a lot of new magazines, but also you get series like these for, for the autodidacts, people who want to know literature. So this is a re-release of an 18th century novel um, with a little introduction by the professor of, of English literature at UCL telling you what you should think about this, you know, placing this, contextualizing it. But he can't help taking the piss. He can't help you know, the fact that this bloody novel, no one, they all stop, no one can stop bursting into tears. So at the end of his introduction, he's written an index to tears, a, a two page index of every moment. They, the, here we go, tears add energy to benediction, page 31. Not a moistened eye, page 53. I could only weep, page 95. Big drops, wetted gray beard, 137. Some of them get really baroque, tears mingled with his. Where's the, the, the uh, um, particularly strange one? Tears like, um, uh, tears like Cestus of Cytherea. Page 26. I'm not sure, <laughs> but I'm sure, I'm sure that's a very oratund classical reference. I bet he cried big tears, did Cestus. <laughs> so the um, another novel, again, that you touch on is Clarissa, the really mm. successful, one of the most successful novels ever, really, of 1748 by Samuel Richardson, um, which, which uh, amazingly, uh, the book originally ran to seven volumes and a million words. Yeah, but then and he that had an index, didn't it? I think, I think he expanded it to nine. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the seven volumes didn't do it justice. So, um, so it becomes slightly longer. And then, um, and then Richardson spends a long time compiling an index for yeah. it, which, which uh, Dr. Johnson says is a great idea because, really, because this is a book that he thinks people will come back to. It's not the long straight road. Um, Richardson wants this to be a, a novel of instruction that people will use this to uh, to take uh, morally nourishing examples to, to sort of lecture their children you know take down from the shelf and uh, uh, here, here's why you shouldn't misbehave and so the index um, is, is, is full of these kind of uh, um, moments uh, or kind of epigrams really um, the index has already done the job of thinking the novel filtering the novel into how is this morally useful what are the ways in which people might want to learn from Clarissa or, or preach, essentially, preach from Clarissa. And so, yeah, Clarissa is a very early novel that has, has an index. In a way, I think it's because the novel is so fresh that, that before you get to the late 18th century and the 19th century, by the 19th century, we know fiction has an index, novels don't have an index. But yeah. at the time of Clarissa, things are still kind of up for grabs. Who says there's a novel a, should look like this or, or, or not? It's still There's a very of, good line you quote by John Updike. Uh, we said the most biographies are just novels with indexes. So maybe that's, that's <laughs> such a good line, I thought. Um, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Up Updike's idea there is that most biographies are so full yeah. of shit that they're, they're, they're yes. so sort of fictionalized that they might as well, uh, um, they might as well be uh, shelved as, as nonfiction. It's just that they look different. Well, tell us another wonderful section in the book is, is basically the index used as a weapon. Explain that. Explain how, how that can be used well, maliciously. Yeah. So I, I was talking about the way with uh, uh, novels in Richardson time, no, novels in the 1740s, the, the, the genre, the form hadn't really sort of settled down. But what, what happens with anything is that when a form does settle down, when a form becomes familiar, when enough people know what it looks like, um, you're able to start playing with it, playing off it. So the index really uh, um, gets a, a, a boost, gets a kickstart in the 16th century from, from print. And by the time you get to the, the, the late 17th century, everybody knows what an index looks like. In early indexes, you often get a paragraph of instruction at the top. It's seriously saying the way this works is you, you, you look up something yeah. in, in the alphabet, blah, blah, blah. Um, no one needs that but by the, by the late 17th century. So everybody knows what an index looks like. So it's ripe for somebody to start playing with it. So I've got a book here. This is a book from 1698. Um, it's, it's known as Boyle, Boyle on Bentley or Boyle against Bentley. What's happened here is there's a, 
uh, an academic controversy concerning the, the, the uh, um, these letters, ancient Greek letters, um, epistles, supposedly by a tyrant called Phalaris. They get edited and published by a man from Christchurch, Oxford, called Charles Boyle, and then a man called Richard Bentley um, publishes a tract that says, oh, come on, these aren't real. We can tell that these are forgeries. They're three or four hundred years too late. Um, and uh, Boyle is, is incredibly upset and angry, and Boyle and his friends get together to produce this book, which accuses Richard Bentley of being arrogant, of being wrong, of being a pedant, and worst of all, of being an index scholar. The reason they call him an index scholar is, how does he know that the letters can't be from 500 BC? Well, he says, well, certain words didn't enter sort of Greek uh, um, vocabulary till three or 400, four or 300 BC. So he's doing this, this quite pedantic, tight um, philological scholarship, dating things. Um, which involves looking things up in tables, which involves comparing texts, comparing words from texts, looking things up in lists or indexes. So Bentley's accused of being an index scholar, which is the worst thing. So at the back of this book, after making fun of him for, for 300 pages, um, the wags come up with, I'm going to see if I can show it to the screen. They come up with an account of Dr. Bentley by way of index, which is actually an index to this book, but really all of the entries in it are just how terrible Bentley is. So we get certain entries like um, his singular humanity, that's very sarcastic, to Mr. Boyle, his appeal to foreigners, that's a terrible thing in those days, um, his pedantry, his familiarity with books that he never saw, his collection of asinine proverbs, and each of these has a series of page numbers afterwards. So if you want to know about his pedantry, you can jump to uh, pages. Uh, and so on. So what we've got here is the index being turned into a joke, the index being turned into an attack on somebody. This is 1698, and suddenly this idea really catches on. Okay, I can actually use an index to mock somebody. Somebody puts out a book I don't like, I'm going to write an index to it, attacking all of the moments where it looks silly or juvenile or its grammar's bad. Um, I'm going to read you a little example, actually. Do you mind if I'm just no, going to another, right. another little reading from, uh, uh, from the book about this moment. So the master of this form, the master of the attack index is a man called William uh, uh, King. He's a bit of a hero of mine. Um, here he is attacking the Royal Society. So we've heard of the Royal Society, that scientific institution that's still going, they do the, the Christmas lectures, founded in 1660. Um, so it's still pretty fresh and it's got this publication, it's got its journal called the Transactions of the Royal Society. And William King really hates this. The society had been founded in 1660 and its journal came into being five years later. Rather than simply writing up the papers and the experiments that were given by the society's more eminent members at its London headquarters, the transactions would publish correspondence from amateur scientists, the length and breadth of the country. In 1700, the editor was Hans Sloan, and William King was infuriated by both Sloan's style and the material he included, seemingly unquestioningly, unquestioningly as editor. In the preface to a pamphlet called The Transaction Year, the year is 1700, by the way, published anonymously, but by William King, King complains that all who read his transactions, either in England or beyond the seas, cry out that the subjects which he writes on are generally so ridiculous and mean, and he treats of them so emptily and in a style so confused and unintelligible, that it's plain he's so far from any useful knowledge that he wants even common grammar. King decides that the best way to satirize the journal is simply to quote from it. The inherent ridiculousness will be evident. He claims that Sloane's shortcomings are so notorious from every line he has published that his own words will be the best proof of what I say. And I've been so careful in reproducing them that I defy him to show that he's once misrepresented. So it's a real kind of like, uh, uh, um, just give him enough rope thing. In the index, these selective quotations 
are summed up in a phrase, a mocking synopsis that pricks the pomposity of the original by puckishly shining a light on its latent preposterousness. So here, for example, is a passage on the effects of the opium poppy, quoted verbatim, quoted exactly from an article that was published in the Transactions a couple of years before. The author reports on a Cornish apothecary, a man called Charles Worth, who has caused a pie to be made of said poppy. So here it is. It says, eating of said poppy pie whilst hot, he was presently taken with such a kind of delirium as made him fancy that most he saw was gold. And calling for a chamber pot, being a white earthen one, after having purged by stool into it, he broke it into pieces and bid the bystanders to save them, for they were all gold. So he's broken up his ship uh, and, and is calling, calling it gold. But these were not all the effects of the Papava Corniculatum, the, the yellow horned poppy. Um, for the man and maid servants, having also eaten the same pie, stripped themselves quite naked and so danced one against another for a long time. The mistress, who has gone to market, coming home and saying, how now? What is there to do? The maid turned her bridge against her and, purging stoutly, said, there, mistress, is gold for you. Too much information. King certainly thinks so. So the transaction is, transaction is index sums up all we need to know in glorious fashion. It says, Charles Worth, his man and maid, all merrily be shat. Page 39. <laughs> Other entries include Mr. Ray's definition of a dildo, page 11. A China ear picker, page 15. Picking the ears too much, dangerous, page 15. That men can't swallow when they're dead, page 28. That a shell is not a crust, page 31. Dr. Lister bit by a porpoise and how his finger fell sick thereupon, page 48. The head that was a bag, page 56. Hogs that shite soap, page 66, and cows that shite fire, page 67. <laughs> I want to say we've, uh, we're going to have some questions shortly, Dennis, mm. um, some great questions actually, but I, I, I did want to mention before we close um, the last vital part of your book, which of course is the index to mm. index a history of the, um, which has just got so many good jokes in it. Um, it's 31 pages long, two of which are devoted variants to the word index. The first uh, entry uh, on index cites pages 309 uh, to 40. I, it, 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 well, no, is that, that's, the, the, that's the index, isn't it? Yes, that's the whole index. Um, and the third, uh, you know, it's just, it's just great. And the last entry in the index is this cryptic line, ZZZ and so to bed PCB. And I wondered what the heck PCB <laughs> might mean. So of course, as you can, I Googled the letters PCB and I thought it can't be printed circuit board, Pakistan cricket board, page created by, that sounds promising. Surely not politically correct bollocks? No, it can't be that. What it is, is Paula Clark Bain, isn't it? Who's she? Paula Clark Bain is a professional indexer, a member of the Society of Indexers, um, a, a particularly masterful indexer. Um, and she uh, not only indexed the book, she, she's also, or, or at least was when she did the index to this uh, this spring, was in training to be a cryptic crossword compiler. Amazing. It's and, a brilliant uh, index. You have to congratulate her if she's not here. It's, it's full of these, these sort of cryptic things, as you say, and little bits of, of word golf and games and anagrams and acrostics um, and little sort of nods to, uh, um, to call, calls out to different parts of the book and, and things like that. It's a real kind of masterpiece of A, being a very useful index that really serves the book well, but B, being a, 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 a kind of... <laughs> a kind of a uh, profound insight in, in, into Paula's uh, 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 cryptic uh, way of thinking. One of the things you mentioned, the two, two great things about that, one is that um, the vast majority of indexes are women, aren't they? Yes. Today, yes. they always have been. Uh, no, they haven't always been. No, the, the change happened in 1894. 
um, the, the change happened with a woman called Nancy Bailey, who we, we simply can't give enough thanks to. Nancy Bailey started uh, an agency in Bloomsbury in London, training young women to become indexers and taking on indexing work for them. Up until then, um, it, it really was largely a male profession, but Nancy Bailey then also not only set up an indexing agency, she did an awful lot of advertising around what was called the, uh, uh, the, the women problem. What jobs were women going to that's, do since they were barred from most, most avenues of employment? That's so interesting. Yeah, it's, she's an it's, absolute it's, heroine. Yeah, it's absolutely wonderful. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you know what a thing called Moravec paradox is. Do you ever come across that? No. It's a brilliant idea. It's true. It's the idea that computers, thinking of Google again, going back to the beginning, mm. things that we tend to think are very, very difficult, like um, corporate finance, uh, higher mathematics, and so on, computers can do with ease. Even, even um, serious lawyers, you know, they are replacing lawyers. Things that we take for granted that any five-year-old can do, like lacing a pair of trainers, uh, uh, computers find almost impossible. They've only just managed to build a robot that can assemble a simple IKEA bookcase. And they have not invented a robot yet that can lace up an ordinary pair of child's trainers. It's too complicated. And here's the thing, this is what I love about the humanity of your book, which sings through it all the time, apart from the fun and the naughtiness, is that indexing, a good index, still needs a human being, right? A hundred percent, absolutely, yeah. Um, really you would all... think it'd be the most computerizable thing, but actually tell us why, <laughs> why you need a human to do a good subject index. Well, I should say, first of all, in my book, we've got two indexes because I wanted to demonstrate that, not just tell people that, but demonstrate it. So there's, there's uh, the first few pages of an index that was compiled by uh, artificial intelligence indexing software. And it's not as bad as I hoped. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I was really, I, actually, it's the second time I ran. I got, got a piece of software to demonstrate this, and it was terrible. And the index was invented by a man called uh, Hugh of Saint Cher, a uh, small village in the south of France called Saint Cher, C H E R. And the. Um, well, not just him, though. There was the Brit, wasn't there? Robert Gross. Robert Gross. That's Robert another Gross. great fact. The index was invented by two people simultaneously in the same year in different countries. But the. the computer program compiling the index just saw the word share, as in sunny and share. So I, I was looking through the index and I noticed, God, share's in this book. I don't, I don't remember mentioning mm -hmm. share. In fact, she's in it quite a lot in chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> and this, was, this was the idiot computer who, who yeah. thought that, that share, as in, you know, do you believe in life after love, had a major starring role in, in the Middle Ages. Um, and then we have Paula's index. So I wanted to put the, 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 the bad computer index up against Paulus, just show, okay, uh, uh, there is indexing software at the moment, um, but what's it like compared to this, this sort of masterpiece of, of, of um, sort of intelligence and wit um, th that a human can come up with? At the moment, uh, the computers are, are a long way behind in the race. No doubt they'll catch up, um, but it was very gratifying to be able to include both indexes and show, actually, here's the thing you think might be, might be easy, um, breaking a book down into to alphabetical entries. One of the reasons why it doesn't work so well is um, for a start, uh, a good indexer needs to find other ways of saying things. So to, an example I often give is, is the, in the Bible, there's the story of the prodigal son. Um, so the trouble is it doesn't contain the word prodigal and it doesn't contain the word mercy and it doesn't contain the word forgiveness. So okay. somebody says, you know, where's that famous story about mercy and forgiveness? Oh, the prodigal son. None of those is going to help you, either, either in an English Bible or a Latin Bible. Um, so you need somebody to know, oh, prodigal son, you mean, blah, blah, I forgot where it is. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. No, that's, it's great. And actually, uh, I, I gather that uh, Paula Clark Bain is actually online now. Um, so congrats from all of us, Paula. Yay. So, Dennis, we, we uh, three quarters now, that went like lightning, didn't it? Uh, um, and so let's take a few questions because um, Daisy's kindly uh, sent me some on text. Now, this is not, uh, these are not the questions I chose, but they come in this order. Mark Griffiths asked, always love the funny index and John and Douglas Adams is the meaning of live. Can you tell us about it? So I, I was going to mention that anyway, but we didn't have time because here it is. This is for people who don't know. It's a dictionary of things there ought to be words for but aren't, and all the words themselves are place names, okay? And so obviously it's then 
It's in alphabetical order, starting with Alst, one who changes his name to be nearer the front. Um, I forget what the Z is. And I've, this is the first index I ever wrote. Um, and because it's a silly, funny book. And so it's fun to, and it echoes some of the things in your uh, book because unusually the index has no page numbers because it doesn't need to because the, uh, all the definitions are alphabetical. So it was great fun to write. I mean, the entry on noses goes on for nearly a page. Noises. <laughs> noises bodily benign is a Betton. Bubbling and inopportune is a Tamby. A tumby. Burbling and nocturnal is a Bonkle. Discreet but unwelcome, Afcot. Distant and meaningless, Amersham, and so on, so on it goes. So <laughs> it was enormous fun to write. It's because, so that's why, but also this is much easier because it's alphabetical, but... God, you know, I do appreciate an index. I having to have to do this all myself. It, it's it's a it's a damn tough job. Okay, now let's proper questions to you. Um, Anon, did the Bible ever have an index? I think yeah, you can that good question. The first index. Uh, um, well, John mentioned indexes were invented uh, um, twice at the same time. They're like like light bulbs or calculus. One of these inventions that that uh, uh, the, the moment is so ripe that two people invented at the same time. Um, in, in Oxford, we have a man called Robert Grosstest who indexes everything. He's the great kind of polymath of the age and everything he reads, he writes a kind of uh, parchment Google to index that. But in Paris, in the year 1230 or thereabouts, um, the first Bible index, it's a word index. It's like, like I say, it, 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 won't, it won't find prodigal for you. Um, but the Bible is broken down into its words and those words put in alphabetical order. And that's called a concordance. And that was done by the friars at the, uh, at the Priory of Saint-Jacques, um, just on, on the left bank of Paris, round about uh, uh, 100 metres away from where the Pantheon is nowadays. So um, this is an interesting question. Well, you've answered the next one from Anon. Did an indexes arrive in different languages at the same time? So definitely French and English anyway. I'm afraid that they're, they're all Latin, basically. Oh, all Latin, okay. All Latin, yeah. Of course they would be. So Frank Wigger asks, what's the secret of a really good index? We should ask Paul <laughs> of that, shouldn't we, really? We should ask Paul And also, have you, somebody else has asked, have you ever written an index yourself or have you always had a professional index? That's a, that's a really good question. The answer is no, I haven't. I've always got professionals to do it. I've always thought, uh, um, well, A, that would be really long uh, and hard and B, uh, I, I, I don't presume that I'd actually do a good job um, so since there's a professional body who, who do, I do want people to be able to use my books um, as best uh, um, in the most, um, uh, in the best way. And I think me providing the index wouldn't give them that experience. So I've always used uh, indexes from the society. Actually, one other thing to say about that is, is when you use a professional indexer, they all have different expertises. So I did a book about French literature and I hired somebody to index it who had a degree in, in French because she was going to be able to, um, you know, spot things that, that somebody who didn't wouldn't. So cookbooks, you have specialists in cookbooks. If you want a medical textbook, it's very important that the person who's doing that has some understand. Otherwise, you know, the, the doctor who's trying to use it won't be able to find what they need. So um, indexes have expertises. And when I've chosen um, indexes for my books, I've always thought about, well, who do I want? Who, would, who has the skills? Um, to do the best job on this book. Great. So what it says here, what is your preferred plural of index? Indexes, not right. indices, indexes. Shakespeare says indexes in uh, Toilet and Cressida. And I, I think my uh, logic is if it's good enough for Shakespeare to use the <laughs> anglicised form, um, then it should be good enough for the rest of us. So indices are things that you find in statistics, economics, mathematicians like them, indexes, are what we use at the back of books. That's good. So talking about mathematicians, why do we talk about economic indexes? How did that come to be associated with money and markets? <laughs> I I, I've got to be honest, I don't know the answer. Uh, that, Dennis, we found something you don't know. This is incredible. <laughs> you, I, I, I'm going to wing it. Okay, well, it, it, was, it was a Saturday afternoon, the year was 1631. There was, there was <laughs> an accountant in Venice sitting, balancing his books, and he said to himself, Indice. I've, I've got no idea, no idea. That's fascinating. So 
When did professional indexing start? Did people originally index their own books? That's a really good question. Uh, um, we actually have records of people being paid to compile indexes in the 1320s, in the quarter, the, when what? the Supreme Court was in Avignon. Yeah. That's amazing. So, yeah, the first record of, of a payment being made to somebody to compile an index is, is from the, the, the paper records it, it, when uh, from, from Avignon, I think, I think 1320s. So the professional indexer is, uh, predates the, the printed book by, by more than a century. Um, here's a good question. Why are some indexes so bad? Is it because the compiler is badly paid? You've got some great examples of bad indexes in <laughs> yeah. your book. No, it's because it's the compiler wasn't paid at all. It's because either a piece of software was used to do it or because the, comp the, the author, um, time poor author, tried to do it himself. Um, <laughs> um, I did a book um, and I didn't have a say. This is a book where the, the publisher provided an index and just sent it to me to sign off on. So we're very, my, time's very tight. We've done an index for you. It was a book about translation. It's called Babel, Adventures in Translation. And I got this index and under the T's, it said translation, page 117. <laughs> this, is, this is absurd. Yeah. I think it had been run through some very poor software. So basically anything that started with a capital letter, including some completely sort of non-proper nouns, just, just silly words that came at the start of a sentence turned up in the index. Um, yeah, so that's why we get bad indexes because, because people who are time poor uh, try to find workarounds. Very good. So uh, here's a good question. What have we lost finding everything, everything out via Google rather than an index? Well, uh, um, that's a good question. Well, while you're pondering that, are there equivalents to an index in logographic or, or i.e. non-alphabetical languages? Can I answer that one first? Hmm. Um, there are indeed, um, and indexes in Chinese emerge quite late. I mean, do, do you think the Chinese invented everything many centuries before, um, before the West? In the case of the index, indexes only start to appear in Chinese round about the turn of the 20th century, late 19th, early 20th century. And one of the problems is because I said at the start that an index is based on two columns, one of which is in alphabetical order. Now, in uh, um, the, the Chinese alphabet doesn't really have an alphabetical order or, or, or an, uh, an order that people could know, an order to put those characters in that would make sense needed to be derived. So the problem arose when medical books from the West, the Chinese started to translate Western medical books um, and these, these had and needed indexes. So the problem was, well, for these textbooks to be valuable, and they are, the, 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 this is important medical knowledge, how are we going to, to arrange them? And so for that, the, I think the, the four corner arrangement of, of the Chinese uh, um, lettering system had to be derived so that, okay, if, if that corner looks like that, it's going to come before that and so on. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's a really good question. Um, indexing in non-Roman scripts comes rather late and, and brings with it a host of problems. Yes, I, I still don't understand how a Chinese typewriter works if you've got mm. 80,000 characters. I don't mm. know. I'll have to work, find that out. Um, yeah, that is, that is a very interesting question. So um, hashtags, they're a kind of uh, index, aren't they? Yeah, they are indeed. I've got, I've got a good story about that. So I think hashtags, hashtags are, are the way that we use indexes in everyday life. So when you, I hope you're going to tell the story I like about hashtags. <laughs> Go on. When you, when you put something on Twitter, put something on Insta, and you hashtag it, what you're doing is attaching a label so that everything else that, that you know, hashtag, what's Arsenal Everton tonight, hashtag Ars Ev or something, um, everybody else who's in that, they can find your thing because it goes into that bucket. So it's really like an index headword. So when we do that, what we're doing is we're indexing. We're indexing. It's a sitter boss, isn't it? It's a sitter boss, really. Yeah, yes, very good. Um, so my favourite thing about this is is uh, when when these hashtags go wrong. Um, when Susan Boyle brought out her fourth album in the years twenty twelve, I think um, the the record company decided to decided on a hashtag so everybody could celebrate um, Susan's uh, Susan's. Album, uh, Susan Album Party was the hashtag, hashtag Susan Album Party. Trouble is you, you elide the spaces. So Susan Album Party is also Sue's Anal Bum Party. And uh, 
not everybody, not everybody who posted in that hashtag was was completely on board with Susan's album. I have to say, <laughs> she broke uh, the internet that day, but but not necessarily for the right reasons. Um, well, uh, we're so we've just got to see if I've got any more questions, Dennis, before we have to wrap up here. Uh, no, I think they've uh, they're probably like I was having read the book. It's, what I have to say, one thing's wonderful about the book is it's so engagingly written, given that it's about a very dusty set of subjects. It's, it, I read the whole book in a single day and I enjoyed it. I it raced through it. It was like reading a novel. It was really great fun. Um, and, you know, the idea of coming in, as I said, that it was, uh, what's this? Here we, here's one. Emojis. What have they done to indexes? Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. There is one in, in, in my index. I, I believe Paula has put an emoji um, in the index to my book. Um, I wouldn't know where to start organizing them though. Do, do, they, do they fall into a particular order? Do people know that order? Uh, I don't, I don't know. So. There are very few books that are in emoji though. There's, there's emoji dick, um, but uh, you only, it only becomes a problem when you have something that's in emoji that needs ordering. Yeah, actually I was just trying to remember you when you, the Sue's, Sue's anal bum party. I remember there used to be a website which is for an Italian um, electricity company called PowerGen Italia. But of course, when it ran to it, it was PowerGen Italia. <laughs> Don't know if that still exists. Um, but uh, gosh, I, I don't. I wonder if this time we've got anything else to. Um, some, uh, oh yeah, I tell the story. This is a great story about William Buckley and the New York mayoral election in 1961 and Norman Mailer. Oh, well, this is the thing that I got told the most. So many of the things in the book, actually, I, I did an awful lot of time in, in sort of dusty libraries in, in Oxford and, and, and Washington and, and, and France and stuff. Um, but actually, but most of the stories that made it into the book are things that people told me. I'd say I'm writing a book about indexes and people would say, ah, oh, have you included yeah. such and such? And the story that I got told the most was this one. Um, in 1967, a man called William F. Buckley but, but, but he went on to be quite a, a TV star in um, a political commentator in the States, ran for mayor of New York unsuccessfully, um, but he went on to write it up. He wrote a book called The Unmaking of a Mayor, which was his sort of journalistic account of running unsuccessfully to be mayor of New York. Um, and during the course of writing the book, he, he had some correspondence with his sort of frenemy, Norman Mailer. He had this, this sort of scrappy friendship with Norman Mailer. Uh, Mailer said he couldn't include correspondence between them in the book. Um, anyway, when the book came out, he sent Norman Mailer a copy. And uh, at the back, at the index, next to Mailer, comma, Norman, page 331, he'd written, hi, Red Biro, hi, exclamation mark. The idea being that Norman Mailer would be the one person who's narcissistic enough to, first thing he does is open the book and turn to the back. And everybody told me this. When I said I'm writing a book about indexes, everybody said, oh, have you got the story about Norman Mailer? Well, I, I must say, I, I hadn't heard it. And Dennis, I mean- I about it the most is that it turns out it's true. I thought, well, you know, I have heard this story, but I wonder if it's true. And Mailer's books, Mailer's library have been preserved. They're in a, a, um, a library in, in Austin, Texas. And so when I came to write it, I thought, well, I'll just check. And I got in touch with the librarian. I'm gonna hold this up to the screen. You might not be able to see here, but the, no, that's not going to work. Here it is. Here's the page from the book. <laughs> and here's the handwriting going, hi. That's so and my favourite thing about this, so many people have told me that story, and when they do now, I go, actually, it's true. Not only yeah. that, but I've got a photograph of it. You've seen the high, <laughs> you've seen the first page, and I'm at Dennis. It's been such fun, and it's a fantastic read, everyone. You, you, you will get so absorbed, there's so much to think about. So I'm just going to end by paraphrasing the great 19th century essayist, poet, and critic Lee Hunt, who you quote in the book, when he's writing on index volumes of The Spectator and The Tatler, in the 18th century, but easily apply to you, said Lee Hunt, let anyone read this and then call an index a dry thing if he can. Thank you so much, Dennis. You've been amazing. Oh, thank you very, very much for having me. I'm sure they're all applauding at home, but we can't actually hear them. <laughs> I'm going to give you a clap. There you go. Thank you.
And it's John, thank you so much. That was such a fantastic hour. We have just been thrilled to be in your presence and it flew past. We could have listened for much, much longer as lots of people were commenting in the Q&A box. Um, John's latest book is the QI book. Um, Funny, you should ask again, questions answered by the QI elves. Dennis Duncan, Index, A History of the is out now and it is a perfect Christmas present. So I hope that everyone will pick up a copy. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dennis, for making this such a splendid evening. And for this evening, good night to everyone. Thank you, Daisy. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Good night, folks. Night.